studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to, to uh, ASU for a distinguished lecture by a, a distinguished colleague who has been a supporter of, of ACMRS for at least the last 20 years, more than that. We, he, um, Dr. Paul Hartle, he's the senior tutor at St. Catherine's College, University of Cambridge. Um, I don't know if you know about the structure of, of uh, Cambridge and Oxford, but series of colleges united around some common areas like magnificent libraries. St. Catharines is, is one of the youngest upstart colleges. It was founded in 1474, is that right? Three. 1473. <laughs> well, it's a little older than I thought. Um, and, and Paul is a distinguished scholar of early modern British literature. He, he had focused primarily on the afterlife of the classics and has published widely in that area. He's, he's now in, interested in uh, early modern cultural apprehension and appropriation of, of uh, Japan. And uh, he'll be publishing um, a book soon on that. His most recent book, it's two volumes. It, it took him a couple of years to put together. It will look exactly like this in two volumes, probably the same size, different title, The Poems of Charles Cotton. Charles Cotton is a mid-17th century poet. Um, he's better known as a fly fisherman, and he, he completed the second part, or probably contributed to the second part of The Complete Angler. Um, he was a popular poet with people like Samuel Pepys, if you, if you know who he is. Um, William Wadsworth is probably more well known to you. But anyway, look for that. $280? A mere $280. dollars <laughs> <laughs> Start putting away your, your nickels because you'll want both T-shirts will volumes. follow soon. <laughs> the second volume is the most exciting. But Paul is here to talk to us today about mercy and Shakespeare. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This, this, this may not work too well, this lecture, we'll see, okay. Um, there are quite a lot of extracts, which I'm intending to show. Um, it, we think that the visuals will be fine, um, the, the orals may be just a little bit quiet, since it's going to be this little machine, which will be producing all the volume that there is. So what I would ask you to do is to listen very quietly. Um, and still lead to the bits of Shakespeare that you're going to see, which will be quite a lot of bits of Shakespeare, okay? Uh, because he was quite good with words. So I think it's quite nice to have more of him and less of me. Anyway, so um, I think you can read that for the moment, but we're going to need to take the lights out um, for when we start screening things. Probably the moment we take the lights out, I won't be able to read my script. Um, but let me start, anyway, okay. So, compassion. Com, with, passion, suffering. So, suffering with another. Participation in suffering, which is used in English from the middle of the 14th century. Thou may think of wretchedness of thine even Christian, fellow Christian, with pity and of compassion of them. And that's the first use by Richard Roll, who was a hermit. So pity is clearly in the same family of language, and so now would empathy be, with its root in pathé, suffering, the Greek equivalent to the Latin passio. But empathy is a word only born into English in the 20th century, so we shall not find it in Shakespeare. Compassion, however, we find several times as a noun and an adjective. But most strikingly, Shakespeare invents it as a verb in Titus Andronicus. Oh heavens, can you hear a good man groan and not relent or not compassion him? At the very outset of his career, Shakespeare is engaging not only with the concept of compassion, but with its linguistic form, striving to recreate compassion as a doing word, an act in the moment of its performance, not an abstract virtue. To compassion equates with to pity, to cherish, 
to love. It didn't catch on. The next use of the verb is found 20 years after Shakespeare, and there are only a handful of later instances which exist, a word scarcely used, says Dr. Johnson in his dictionary. It is intriguing to find this linguistic innovation in Titus Andronicus, one of the early plays with which Shakespeare made his reputation. Since the compassion for which Titus's brother Marcus is pleading to heaven in the speech quoted is notable by its utter absence from all the principal characters, who happily impose upon one another a cycle of atrocities, including torture, murder, rape, human sacrifice, and unwitting cannibalism, in which bewailing their own suffering never enables them to grasp their enemy's pain except to imagine it as recompense for their own. This bloody cycle of revenge without compassion is encapsulated in the play's final rhyming couplet. Her life was beastly and devoid of pity, and being dead, let birds on her take pity. Well, the failure to find a rhyme for pity other than itself is an act of cancellation of the very idea in this pitiless world. In Francis Bacon's words, in his essay on goodness, the parts and signs of goodness are many. If a man be gracious and courteous to strangers, it shows he is a citizen of the world, and that his heart is no island cut off from other lands, but a continent that joins to them. If he be compassionate towards the affliction of others, it shows that his heart is like the noble tree that is wounded itself when it gives the balm. Compassion, giving the balm, soothing medicine, is the antithesis and the antidote to revenge. In Plutarch's essay, How a Man May Receive Profit by His Enemies, he asserts that to forbear to be revenged of an enemy if opportunity and occasion is offered, and to let him go when he is in thy hands is a point of great humanity and courtesy. But him that hath compassion of him when he is fallen into adversity, succoreth him in distress, at his request is ready for to show goodwill to his children, and an affection to sustain the state of his house and family being in affliction, whosoever doth not love for this kindness, nor praise the goodness of his nature, of colour black he hath an heart. So only the black-hearted will not respect someone who shows compassion for his defeated enemy. The pursuit of revenge may damage the enemy, but it damages the self more. As Bacon emphatically pronounces in his essay of revenge, this is certain, that a man that studieth revenge keeps his own wounds green, open, unhealed, which otherwise would heal and do well. Although it may be unsurprising to find compassion mainly marked by its absence in a revenge tragedy like Titus, we might expect to find more of it in the romantic comedy, which provides the quotation for my title, The Quality of Mercy, which is The Merchant of Venice. Now, I want to watch this, so can we take the lights out? Oops. And I hope you're going to be able to hear it as well. Antonio and old Shylock both stand forth. Is your name Shylock? Shylock is my name. Of a strange nature to suit you for him. Do you 
incontestable. Mm -hmm. From what compulsion must I tell you that? upon my head. I gave the law. Okay. A brilliant as Portia's argument for mercy is, we should note two things. It's an argument that mercy is the property of those in power and authority, which the Jew Shylock is not. And ultimately, it fails. For Shylock, his own wounds are still green, and he wishes them to remain so, hugging suffering to himself, and neither relating nor compassioning his adversary, Antonio. It is not the eloquent plea for mercy, that you just heard, which saves Antonio, but Portia's exploitation of a lexical trick of the law. Shylock can claim a pound of flesh, but not a drop of blood. And once defeated by the law, Shylock is without compassion, stripped of his wealth on the grounds that he is no citizen, but an alien in Venice. His life is spared, but only if he surrenders his property, and perhaps more crucially, his faith. That for this favor, he presently become a Christian, or else I do recant the pardon that I may pronounce it here. Thus far, we've encountered no forbearance to be revenged of an enemy, to use Plutarch's formula. Nor would we find it in Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida, which ends not like Homer's Iliad, which is its source, with Priam's visit to Achilles to beg the body of Hector his son for burial, and forced to kiss that hand that slew my children, Awakening Achilles' compassion moved so much he could not look upon the weeping father. But instead, Shakespeare's version ends with the news of Hector's unheroic death, killed not in single combat with Achilles, but pulled down by Achilles' myrmidons, news for which Troilus offers no eloquent lament, but the blunt, Hector is dead, there is no more to say. Shakespeare knows then about the uncompassionate, another word which he was the first to use. In the very early play, perhaps his earliest play, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, to which I shall return. But the compassion for enemies advocated by the moralists Plutarch and Bacon, and evinced by Achilles for Priam, 
does find its place in several plays. In Romeo's merciful laying of Count Paris in the tomb with Juliet. In Mark Antony's speech over the dead Brutus in Julius Caesar, this was the noblest Roman of them all. And in Octavius Caesar's reciprocal sorrow over Antony's death in Antony and Cleopatra, it is a tidings to wash the eyes of kings. To compassionate even the just sufferings of those who have wronged us has biblical as well as classical precedent. When Mary had murmured against Moses, and for the foulness of her fault, God, who was most zealous of his servant's estimation, had stricken her with a loathsome leprosy, this is obviously not the Virgin Mary, Moses, as the scripture reporteth, being the mildest man upon earth, could not suffer this just punishment to be inflicted upon her, but presently demanded of God that he would cure her, whereas it seems that he neither perceived the injury nor could endure the revenge. Moses' human compassion for Mary, suffering with her pain, contrasts with a zealous God's indifferent justice. Compassion for the suffering of the innocent is both less difficult and less theatrically interesting than for the guilty. If we return to Two Gentlemen of Verona, Shakespeare's earliest comedy, we can see him struggling with the theatrical problem of forgiveness for the unworthy. To summarize the plot, the two gentlemen, Valentine and Proteus, are best friends. Valentine loves Sylvia, Proteus, Julia. Proteus, on seeing Sylvia, decides he loves her, and no longer loves Julia, who disguises herself as a boy and follows him, unrecognised, thereby entering the company of Valentine and Sylvia. By the play's final scene, Valentine has withdrawn into the forest as an outlaw chief, and Sylvia follows him there, herself followed by Proteus, himself followed by Julia. Sylvia is attacked by the outlaws, unbeknownst to Valentine, and Proteus rescues her before attempting to force her sexually, and being discovered by Valentine, who condemns him, treacherous man. Proteus immediately repents, my shame and guilt confounds me, and Valentine instantly forgives him before saying, in words which continue to astonish readers and audiences, and that my love may appear plain and free, all that was mine in Sylvia, I give thee. Throughout this exchange between the two male friends, which lasts a whole 23 lines, Sylvia is silent. Indeed, she never speaks again in the play. No wonder, then, that Simon Godwin director of the most recent Royal Shakespeare Company production, the first in the main theatre for over 30 years, describes this as a notorious scene, very hard to make believable sense of, which easily puts off audiences. So, let us see what he does with it. <coughs> That's Valentine. How use does the reader have it with a man? This shall be desert, lazy, unfrequented woods. I better brook than flourishing people town. Here, when I sit alone, unseen of any, and to the nightingales complaining notes, tune my distresses to call my words. Now the dust and habit in my breast. We brought the mansion so long tenantless, lest growing ruinous, the building fall and leave no memory of what it was. Repair me with thy presence, Sylvia. Thou gentle nymph. Cherish thy forlorn sway. What hallowing and what stir is this today? Uh, these are my mates that make their wills their law, have some unhappy passenger in chase. <laughs> they love me well, yet I have much to do to keep them from uncivil outrages. <laughs> Withdraw thee, Valentine. Business comes here. 
Why? Why, how like a dream is this? I see it here. Love, lend me patience to forbear a <laughs> Madam, this service have I done for you, though you respect not all your servant doth. To hazard life and rescue you from him that would have forced your honor and your love. Thou saved me from my need but one fair look. A smaller boon than this I cannot beg, and less than this I'm sure you cannot give. Oh, unhappy that I am! Unhappy were you, madam, ere I came. But by my coming have I made you happy. Mine I approach, that makes me most unhappy. Had I been seized by a hungry lion, I would have been a breakfast to the beast, rather than have false Proteus rescue me. Oh, God, be judged how I love Valentine, whose life's as tender to me as my soul. And as much, for more there cannot be, I you detest false. Perjured Proteus. Therefore, be God. Solicit me no more. What dangerous action stood it next to death? Would I not undergo for one calm look? Oh, tis the curse in love and still approve when women cannot love where they're beloved. When Proteus cannot love where he's beloved. Read over Julia's heart, thy first, best love, for whose dear sake thou didst arrange thy faith into a thousand oaths, and all those oaths descended into perjury to love me. Thou hast no faith left now, unless there is two, and that's far worse than none, better have none than plural faith, which is too much by one. Now count it to thy true friend in love, who respects friend all men but Proteus. Friend, if the gentle spirit of moving words cannot change you to a milder form, I'll woo you like a soldier, an arms end, and love you against the nature of love. Force ye, I'll force you, yield to my desire. Ruffian, let go that brute uncivil touch, a friend of an ill fashion. Without common friend, that is without faith or love, for such is a friend now. No, thou treacherous man, thou hast beguiled my hopes. Not that my eye could have persuaded me, though I dare not say I have one friend alive. Thou wouldst disprove me. No. Who can be trusted when one's right hand is perjured to the bosom? Oh, Proteus, I am sorry I must never trust thee more, but count the world a stranger for thy sake. <laughs> Not! The private wound is the deepest of time most accursed, amongst all foes of a friend should be the worst. Valentine, if hearty sorrow be sufficient ransom for offence, I tender it here. I do as truly suffer as ever I did commit. Then I am paid. 
once again I do receive being honest. The cry of repentance is not satisfied, is nor of heaven nor earth, for these are pleased. By penitence, the eternal's rocks are pleased. And so that my love may appear plain and free, all that was mine in Sylvia, I give thee. entertained him deeply in her heart. How oft hast thou with perjury cleft the root? O oh, Proteus, let this habit make thee blush. Be thou ashamed that I have took upon me such an immodest raiment, if shame live in a disguise of love. It is the lesser blot. Modesty finds women to change their shapes than men their minds. That men their minds. Oh heaven, tis true. For man but constant, he will have that. That whatever fills him with cause, <coughs> makes him run through all the sins in constancy falls off, ere it begins. What is in Sylvia's face that I may not strive more fresh in Julia's with a constant eye? Oh, come, come, come. A hand from either. <laughs> Let me be blessed to make this happy close. For pity such friends should be long closed. Bear witness heaven. I have my wish forever. Okay. So you can see that the crucial change made there is that we don't only have Julia placed in a central position now, exposing her body to the others and to the audience, but Sylvia who becomes both anything but a passive victim of sexual assault and also the agent of forgiveness, included within a circle from which Shakespeare rather pointedly excluded her, silenced by pain and shock. A happy resolution of the four-way relationship is achieved and the audience goes home content. At the end of the much later play, Cymbeline, one of Shakespeare's last rather than first works, another three-way crisis comes to resolution, when the man who is falsely accused the heroine of adultery with him confesses his crime to her and her husband, offering his life as the price of his deceit, to be met with a response from the husband, which might have been learned from Plutarch, the power that I have on you is to spare you, the malice towards you to forgive you, live and deal with others better. Written at the same time, Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, a tragedy which changes into a comedy, brilliantly enacts the move from condemnation to compassion, 
in the figure of Paulina, the painfully frank and direct companion of Leontes' queen Hermione, bringing him the news that Hermione has died as a result of her husband's insanely evil persecution. Chapel where they lie, and 
teams said that we might recreate Lead me to these songs. So Leontes is begging further condemnation from Paulina. Go on, go on. Thou canst not speak too much. I have deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest. But she turns away from that, from the verbal assault. What's gone and what's past hell should be past grief. Do not receive affliction at my petition. I beseech you rather let me be punished that have minded you of what you should forget. Unlike the previous instances of compassion, which were all of one man for another, here we find a woman's compassion for the man who has killed her friend. And in this, Shakespeare exemplifies Elizabethan opinion. Women, by nature, are inclined more to mercy and pity than men, because the tenderness of their complexion moveth them more to compassion. Such compassion is to be seen in Cordelia's tears for her beleaguered father in King Lear. That was an interesting sound. <laughs> Not similar to Cordelia's tears. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> tears which are described by the gentleman to Kent as holy water from her heavenly eyes. A religious emphasis which recalls the Virgin Mother Mary. Mater Misericordiae in Latin, who compassionately intercedes for humanity at the last judgment. In the uneasy comedy Measure for Measure, the Duke's deputy Angelo, endowed with absolute authority, sees himself as the impartial, unbending voice of the law, not like the Duke in Merchant of Venice, regretfully incapable of any action not in accordance with the letter of the law, but who relishes its inflexibility. The young Claudio is sentenced to death for fornication, for sleeping with the girl to whom he is betrothed but not yet married. Claudio's sister, Isabella, a novice about to enter the nunnery, is encouraged by the feckless Lucio to plead for her brother's life.
King Lear begins its slow ascent from darkness towards light when the Duke of Cornwall's servant, 
horrified at his master's vicious blinding of the elderly Earl of Gloucester in Gloucester's own house, is revolted and literally revolts against him. Hold your hand, my lord. I have served you ever since I was a child, but better service have I never done you than now to bid you hold. Although this anonymous servant, like the anonymous messenger there, fails to save Gloucester's eyes and dies for his extraordinarily subversive redefinition of loyal service, Cornwall is mortally wounded, and Gloucester's plight earns compassion from two other servants. I'll fetch some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Now heaven help him. And after Gloucester is turned out of the house, an old man, Gloucester's tenant for 80 years, determines to find clothing for the naked beggar accompanying Gloucester. Come on it what will, whatever the consequences to himself. Compassion, I see, is catching. Alongside these anonymous sources of fiercely practical compassion, flax and whites of eggs, the best apparel that I have, we might add the doctor in Macbeth, who having heard Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking confession, advises the nurse, more needs she the divine than the physician. God, God forgive us all. Look after her. And just as it was that anonymous messenger who embodied compassion in the early Titus Andronicus, so in Shakespeare's last play, written collaboratively with John Fletcher, the two noble kinsmen, it's typical that when his daughter is pointing out the two jailed kinsmen to a bystander, the anonymous jailer rebukes her with an appeal to compassionate empathy. Go to, leave your pointing. They would not make us their object. Out of their sight. This is easily the most hu moving human response in a play which is otherwise full of laboured acts of compassion performed for public consumption by Duke Theseus of Athens, the ruler as player. And we might note that Hippocrates is the Greek for actor, hypocrite. A professional actor himself, Shakespeare invested his awareness of compassion as performance into Hamlet's envious admiration of the player's skilled mimicry of a state of compassionate grief. Tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and all for nothing, poor Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? Or we can find that also in the colossal revelation of King Lear's responsibility to his people, never thought of until this rain-drenched moment on the heath. Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, but by the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as this? Oh, says the king, I have taken too little care of this. How must that have sounded in the ears of King James I at the play's first recorded performance on the day after Christmas Day in 1606? Compassion, the plays repeatedly argue, is the nature of humankind. In Thomas Wright's words, for mercy and compassion will move us often to pity, as it did Job. Compassion grew with me from my infancy, and it came with me out of my mother's womb. All the elements of compassion I've so far discussed come together in one beautiful instant, the passionate concern of Miranda, or the suffering mariners in the shipwreck which opens the tempest. Dashed 
all to pieces. Oh, the cry did knock against my very heart. Poor Sophie perished. Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk to sea within the earth or in should the good ship so have swallowed the floating soul within her. Be collected. No more amazement. Tell your piteous heart there's no harm done. No I have done nothing but bear of thee. Of thee, my dear one, thee, my daughter, who art ignorant of what thou art, not knowing of whence I am, nor that I am more better than Prospero, master of a whole poor cell, and I know greater fun. What, you never let of my thoughts? It is time I should inform thee, father. Then thy hand and pluck my magic garment from me. So lie there, my heart. Wipe thou thine eyes and come to The direful spectacle of the wreck that touched the very virtue of compassion in thee, I had with such provision in mine arm. So safely ordered that there is no soul, no, not so much perdition as a hand, fit to any creature in the vessel that thou heardst cry, that thou sawest sink. Sit down. The very virtue of compassion, as Prospero called it, is something untaught to Miranda, for who could teach it? Prospero displays little for Caliban or Ariel, both his servant slaves. Miranda has grown up alone on this island, apart from that trio. And Prospero has brought about the magical shipwreck to draw his enemies into his power, to exact his long overdue revenge. Miranda's compassion, then, is part of her innocence, of her essential human kindness in both senses. Bacon had said that to have compassion of an enemy when he has fallen into adversity shows that the heart is like a noble tree. At the play's end, Prospero relearns his humanity, the remorse which should never be disjoined from power, in his exchange with the non-human Ariel. And this is a different Prospero. Uh, in this case, um, a gender switch by the director, Julie Taymor. So here we have um, Prospero, played by Helen Mirren. Say, my spirit, how fares the king as follows? Just as you left me. All prisoners, my king. The king, his brother, and yours abide all three distracted. But chiefly, him that you termed man, the good old lord Gonzalo. His tears run down his beard like winter's drops from the leaves of reeds. Your charm so strongly works him. If you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. What's the thing, My lord master, were I human? Oh, my child. Hast thou, John, but air? of feeling of their afflictions, shall not myself, one of their kind, be kindlier more than thou art? With their high wrongs, men struck to the quick. Yet with my nobler reason against my few, the rare actions and virtue and vengeance, they being penitent, the soul tried to walk in love is to extend to the crown. My charms are break. Their senses are restored and they shall be themselves. The recognition of fellowship in nature, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply passion as they, 
renders absurd the pursuit of revenge, and Prospero surrenders the power to compel. He breaks that star. He burns that book. He drowns that book. Embracing instead the obligation to persuade, and sometimes to fail to persuade. I want to end with another great moment of persuasion and compassion in Shakespeare. The speech of Sir Thomas More to the xenophobic London mob, who are rioting in protest against immigration. I'm lucky enough to have, as a fellow alumnus and fellow at St. Catherine's, the great Shakespearean actor Sir Ian McKellen, otherwise perhaps known as Gandalf, um, <laughs> who, on a recent, village, a recent visit to the college, oops, here he is visiting us um, with the rainbow flag um, to celebrate gay and other diverse liberations flying above him. Um, on that visit, what he did was he gave us as a gift, a parting gift, um, the speech that Sir Thomas More makes to the rioting citizens. And that is what I would like you to listen to just for the last few minutes. The situation is that uh, there's been a riot in uh, Trafalgar Square, no, and then it's a massive the field. Uh, against the strangers uh, in their midst. And um, the cry goes out from the mob that uh, strangers should uh, be sent home, really. Um, get rid of them. I mean, they, they eat off food and they speak off languages and they get our way and they put British culture at, at risk and all sorts of things. But, you know, you, you, you kind of think, uh, take stranger to mean not just an immigrant, but anyone who, who is individual and different from the major, majority. And in that sense, you can lift the speech from the fact. And Thomas Moore is a lawyer, and he's sent out to put down the riot by the authorities, and uh, he does it by appealing to their sense of uh, law and order, uh, and also because it's by Shakespeare, and an appeal to their humanity. So if someone says um, that the strangers should be removed, and Thomas More says, grant them removed. And grant that this your noise hath chipped down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, their poor luggage plotting to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you have escaped in your desire. As authority quite silenced by your brawl, and you, in wrath of your opinions, clothed, what have you got? Until you are taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail. A border should be quelled. Yeah. By this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man, for other ruffians as their fancies wrought with self same hand, so reason and so white, would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes feed on one another. Oh, desperate as you are, wash your foul minds with tears. Those same hands that you like rebels lift against the peace, lift up for peace, and your unreverent knees make them your feet to kneel, to be forgiven. You put down strangers, kill them. Cut their throats. Lead the majesty of law and lion to slip in like a hut. So now the king, as he is clever, is the offender born, should so much come too short of your great trespass as but to banish you. Whither would you go? What country by the nature of your error should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, Spain or Portugal, there, anywhere that not adheres to England. Why, you must needs be strangers. 
you'll be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth. Let their detested knives against your throats spurn you like dogs. And like as if the God owns not, nor may not you, nor. This is the strangest place. And this your relentless inhumanity. To which one of those citizens replies, Faith, he says true. Let's do as we may be done by. Let's do as we may be done by.